Well, prescription drug abuse is Oklahoma's fastest growing drug problem, according to the state's mental health commissioner. This spring, the legislature approved an additional $1.2 million for drug and treatment programs through the Department of Mental Health. Even so, lawmakers agree the money is a small amount to fight such a large problem. Earlier, I sat down with Oklahoma Senator Rob Standridge, who's been on the forefront in the fight against prescription addiction. Senator Sandwich, thank you so much for being here. Well, you definitely have a unique perspective as both a pharmacist and a, a lawmaker, if you will. Kind of set the stage for us of where we are right now with prescription drug abuse. Prescription drug abuse, as, as you're probably aware, is a significant problem in all states. But in Oklahoma, particularly, it seems like we're at the top <coughs> of, uh, of that problem. And I think that gives the burden to us to be aggressive in attacking the problem and seeing um, what ways we can help, both legislatively and in discussions like this. How can we start you know, tackling this problem and making Oklahoma not the leader in this? And hopefully what we can do here, maybe other states might follow and find ways to improve their problem as well. From your perspective, are there certain things that are contributing to the problems that we have? Yeah, I think, I think um, uh, as we were talking before off camera, uh, when you look at the Austin Box story, for instance, which is uh, certainly a, a tragic story. Yeah, the young uh, OU football player yes, who, who died of a prescription drug overdose. Right, and, uh, and his family now is kind of being vocal about this and trying to educate others on, on what can happen. And I think you look at that and you think, well, one, you know, prescription drugs are looked at as being safe. And I think probably Mr. Box uh, having pain and other issues maybe that he's using these drugs for thought, well, these are obviously safe because they're prescription. Even though he didn't have prescription for them, they are prescription, so you kind of think they're safe. That's, I think, wrong thinking. They're as dangerous or more so than, than illicit drugs. And then uh, the other one is that we so easily today in today's society treat everything with drugs. And so when you have, when you're down or you have some pain, I mean, that's the, sometimes the first thing we go to instead of dealing with it in other ways. Now you wrote uh, legislation this last session that has now been signed into law by the governor. What will House Bill 1419 do? House Bill 1419, <clears throat> so, so over the years we've collected all of this data about uh, these controlled substances and how patients uh, use them or abuse them. And so we, we've never really involved the physicians in this conversation or, or this, this uh, dialogue about this use. Now they can log onto the internet and log into a patient, but in a busy day of a practice, their time is often not available for that. So what we did with 1419 is allow the Bureau of Narcotics to actually flag a patient in the physician's electronic medical record system that they potentially are a doctor shopper. And so here's a, an icon that might appear in the right screen like an exclamation point or you know blinking light of some type that says, hey, uh, Jane Doe here uh, exhibits um, you know the, the things that we think that she's doctor shopping. Maybe she's went to to five different doctors in the last five days for a controlled substance, so we, we wonder if, so, so the physician now, he is not compelled to do anything, but he or she could use that information to either prescribe something non-controlled or maybe refuse to see the patient. So it, it involves in, in the discussion without any compulsion, so I think it allows that data to be used in, but still not hinder their medical practice and the decisions they wanna make. What is the role that pharmacists play in all this? Well, in my opinion, as a pharmacist, I think we're asked to play too much. I think we are responsible to look at those patients and make judgment calls on what we see. But there's no way a pharmacist can be expected to know the full scope of what a patient does. Typically, they, when they doctor shop, they pharmacy shop. And so when you, when you ask a pharmacist to become a police officer, I think you're going about it the wrong way. I think we can use this data that we're collecting, which the pharmacists are contributing. I think that's a value, valuable role that they can play is their systems can push all this data up to the narcotics people, but they, I think, need to take the next step and to find the people that are breaking the law. Pharmacists aren't breaking the law, physicians aren't breaking the law typically in these drug abuse scenarios. Patients are breaking the law by lying to physicians, lying to pharmacists, uh, going to many to get all these drugs. I mean, that's, uh, I, I think we over-focus sometimes on the medical professionals. I, I, and I want to involve them, but I don't want to hinder their practice. You know, and we talk about breaking the law, and sometimes it seems a little innocuous, and it's just affecting the people that are abusing the drugs. But there are more and more reports of, of break-ins in pharmacies and, and even armed robberies making this almost a, a violent profession, or at least the fear of violence in this profession. Yeah, it, 
It is, and, and you, uh, I, we've been victims ourselves. My wife is a pharmacist as well, and so, uh, yeah, we, it, we need to figure out how we can get a handle on it uh, because it is becoming uh, that way, and that, you know, pharmacies have to fear for this. Before it was the fear of them coming in, maybe still in a few drugs and money primarily. Now you have these guys that may already be strung out on some kind of drugs, and they're just after more drugs. And I think that's a problem. I think it's a law enforcement problem. I think pharmacists can help, but somehow we have got to get, get it under control. And, uh, but but it, is, it is a problem. It, it kind of makes you nervous. Do you see any correlation between prescription drug abuse and then street drug abuse that we, we know is also fairly predominant in the state? Uh, absolutely, I think I think there's definitely correlations between the two. In fact, I've, I've watching videos online and stuff about prescription drug abuse. I hear a lot of the addicts talk about how heroin and oxycodone are kind. Of, they kind of put those in the same boat. So they kind of mentally think about, well, I'd either rather have the prescription drug or rather have the illicit drug. One thing I've heard pretty common, which goes along with my comments about Austin Box a minute ago, uh, something I hear quite often is, well, the prescription drug oxycodone is much better than heroin because I don't have to go down to the street corner and buy it, you know, in a backdoor deal, maybe get shot in the process. I just take it from a friend or steal it out of somebody's medicine cabinet or just go doctor shopping. So they think of it as a much safer, cleaner, and so it's, it's got that mindset that, uh, that it's a better drug abuse than, than an illicit but Elicit's not under control either. So uh, so there are both problems. I was almost shocked to see, and it was uh, the CDC number that said that one in 12 Oklahomans would use a prescription drug for a non-medical use, basically illegally. Well, I've heard these stats too. I've also heard stats like, uh, the more common stat I've heard a few times, I think I heard on CNN not too long ago, was one out of 20 is uh, using a drug not the way it's prescribed or not the appropriate way. I think, I don't know, I'd hate to think that it's one in 12, but, but I don't know. I, I think maybe a lot of that stat is just somebody that's not a drug addict, but they're not using it the way they're supposed to. So, you know, like, you, like if you got maybe some medicine you think might help me, I mean, that's not using it appropriately, but doesn't make me a drug addict. It's not legal, by the way, but I mean, still, that happens and family happens and husband and wife. So a lot of things inappropriately and people would probably answer that questionnaire. I hate to think it's one in 12 that we have a drug problem with. Now, I don't want to make anyone sit through an organic chemistry class here, but are the drugs that we prescribe, uh, prescription drugs that are normally legally, do they work differently than the, the drugs that you might find on the same street, or are they basically the same stuff? Basically, very similar. I mean, you, you have your opiates out there, you have a prescription. I mean, they're all fairly similar. They all come from the same roots. I and mean, we were talking about amphetamines or methamphetamines earlier. Uh, in my opinion, the drug that's causing the addiction is the same drug, whether it's in a Ritalin or it's in a methamphetamine. Now, the long-term uh, negative effects of taking methamphetamine as far as what it does to your person, I think is uh, physically, that is, I think, and mentally, I think is a little different because of the process of making the drug and all of the bad things that get into it. But no, I think the drugs are very, very similar. If they're not the same drugs, they're, they're acting the same to the addict. All right. Thank you so much. Senator Rob Stanbridge, appreciate you coming sure, in the studio. Sure, sure. Anytime. Thank you.